Tonight we'll be in Psalm 31. And I just ask that you'd uh, follow along as we read. Verse 1, Psalm 31, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me and pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. You are my strength. Verse 9, he says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief, yes, my soul and my body. For my life is spent with grief and my days with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I am a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I'm forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many and fear is on every side while they take counsel together against me and scheme to take away my life. But as for me, verse 14, as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Let's pray together. Father, we ask now that you'd bless us as we look into your word. Lord, we've had a chance to give back to you in a small measure through our time of corporate singing and worship, that which you've given to us which cannot be measured. And now our worship continues as we look into your word and desire to study it. So, Lord, cause my words this evening to be yours, words of direction, words of instruction, words of encouragement, but especially, Lord, words of hope. For these things we ask together in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And everyone agreeing said, and the short, pudgy, white-haired, balding Irishman said, what is wrong with my watch? Why is my smartwatch making me look stupid? Well, that's first world problem for sure. Well, as we begin here this evening, I'd like to ask a few questions. How many of you have ever been discouraged? How many of you have ever felt depressed? How many of you have experienced a feeling of despair? You see, I think most of us would agree that even among Christians, these are some common occurrences. In fact, Jesus himself told us, uh, John 16, 33, he said, in the world you will have tribulation. Uh, that word tribulation, you will have tribulation, it can be translated in a number of different ways. You'll be tried, you'll be tested, you'll be tempted, you'll be afflicted, even attacked. He says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, what is it about these things, discouragement, depression, feelings of despair? What is it about those things that can rob us of our joy and leave us feeling vulnerable and exposed? Well, and I certainly don't know all of the reasons, and we don't have time here tonight to discuss more uh, than just one. But I know of that one, and that one is this, that people need a refuge, just as ships from ages past needed a safe harbor to winter in, so many of us often need a place that we can go, a place where we can seek shelter after we've been kicked around and beaten down by the storms of life. And I believe that many of us here this evening would be quick to agree that, that those sorts of shelters and that kind of a refuge is not always easy to come by. In fact, those sorts of refuge and shelters are often in short supply. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about people who care enough to slow down and listen. People who will hear us out without judgment, without criticism. 
People who, when we share something with them in confidence, hold it in confidence. People who can be trusted to keep their word, to do as they say they'll do. So where do you find people like this, a refuge like this, in a need like this for a person like that? Where can you go? Where can you go to find a listening ear, a caring heart, a trustworthy soul? Where can you go? Well, I know where you should be able to go. You should be able to go to the church and to people, believers, brothers and sisters, you and I, just like us here tonight. But unfortunately, uh, we often feel that we can't. And the reason we feel we can't uh, is, well, for the reasons I gave already. People are uh, not willing to slow down and listen. People are not willing to hear us out without judgment or criticism and so on and so on. There's something I read many years ago, 35 years ago at least, maybe as long as 40 years ago, um, reading a devotional thought by Chuck Swindoll. And I grabbed it then and it's been in my archives and I pull it out from time to time and I pulled it out to share with you here tonight. Listen to what he says. By the way, this, this was very likely a devotional thought that he wrote about the time that the television program Cheers uh, first hit the airwaves. So um, I already had children by then. That dates me for sure. But here's what Swindoll says. He says, the neighborhood bar is probably the best counterfeit there is to the fellowship Christ wants to give his church. It is an imitation dispensing liquor instead of grace, escape rather than reality. But it is a permissive, accepting, inclusive fellowship. It's unshockable. It's democratic. You can tell people your secrets and they usually don't tell others or even want to. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into their hearts a desire to know and to be known, to love and to be loved. But the sad fact is so many people seek a counterfeit at the price of a few drinks. Now, that's a sad commentary for what life was then, where uh, it was all about dropping into the bar every night because it was a place where everybody knew your name. And we see much of the same thing going on today. And I see this as being an indictment both against the church in general and against individual Christians in particular. Because as Swindoll stated, and, and, and I agree with his premise that this is the kind of a fellowship, these are the kind of people the Lord would have his people to be. A fellowship where a person is comfortable to come in and say, I've blown it or I'm crushed, or I'm confused, or I'm hurting, or I'm in the pit of despair, or I'm at rock bottom. We're talking about a place where a person can turn when the proverbial bottom has dropped out of his or her life. When their spouse is talking about separation or divorce, when they've just discovered that a close family member has a serious, even a terminal illness, when they find out their teenage daughter is pregnant or that their teenage son is abusing alcohol, doing drugs, when their job is on the line because of budgetary concerns. Now you think, what a random group of things. Like, where did you get that list from? Well, that list is from actual people that myself and the rest of those of us pastors here that deal with pastoral care. This is what our last week looked like. This, this is reality for many of the people who call Cornerstone Chapel their home. So they might be random to you, but it's where I live a lot of the time in pointing people to that place where they can find a refuge. And sometimes being a human agent that will be a refuge myself. These are the very things going on in the lives of so many people around us. If not us, then maybe it's our family members. 
Maybe it's a fellow student. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a co-worker. And, and now personalize it for you as a believer. Where, where would you go? Where can you go when you can't seem to get the victory in that one area of sin or of compromise in your life? Or when you need a willing, listening ear or a strong shoulder of a brother or sister to lean on? When you're having to face an embarrassing situation that... Honestly, you're just reaping what you've sown. What do you do at a time like that? At a time when the circumstances in your life are threatening to completely overwhelm you with fear or anxiety or the feeling of helplessness? Well, as I've suggested to you tonight, what you need then is you need a refuge. And again, that's someone who'll listen to you, someone who'll understand you, someone who'll point you in the direction of the ultimate answer. And David is in a situation like this, and that's why I've chosen this text tonight so we can look together and find some answers. Now, at the writing here of Psalm 31, David is being relentlessly pursued by King Saul and his men. In addition to that, he believes himself to be at least partially responsible for the deaths of Ahimelech the high priest and 84 other priests who were slaughtered by Doeg the Edomite, who was King Saul's chief herdsman, because Doeg saw David at, the, at Nob, at the priest's house, asking for bread and looking for a sword. That's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And on top of that, when we read here in Psalm 31, David has just been betrayed by the inhabitants of Keilah. People he risked his life to defend against the Philistines. You read that in 1 Samuel chapter 23. And so David is feeling very vulnerable to attack and he's wondering who he can trust. He's feeling abandoned and totally alone. And that's when he pens these words recorded for us here in Psalm 31. So with that understanding, we begin again. Verse 1, he says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. Now again, remember, he is on the run from King Saul, doing all he can to stay one step ahead of the murderous intents and pursuits of Saul and his men. And he's waning in strength, and he's wounded in spirit, and he's crying out to the Lord to give him a shelter from the storm. Uh, from the ESV and the NIV, it, it reads differently. It says, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. The Hebrew word, kasa, and it means to seek a trust or to find a refuge. And in the context, it's talking about a place of safety, a place of security, a place of secrecy. And notice in verse 2, he says, bow down your ear to me. Now, this is very picturesque language in the original. The picture here is, is that of someone bending down, coming near, coming close to hear the words of someone who is sick or wounded or even dying. Uh, just over a week ago, I visited a woman here from Cornerstone Chapel. Um, she and her husband raise their children here, and their children are raising their children here. And so three generations of faithfulness here at Cornerstone, and I'm with her in, in hospice, and she can barely speak. She can only just eke out a whisper. And I'm with her, uh, with her husband, with uh, two of her adult sons, with some daughters-in-law, and a couple of grandchildren. And, and I'm holding her hand. And, and she's talking to me, and I'm bending down. I'm bringing my ear as close as I can to hear what she's saying. And she says, I want to glorify God with my death. I want to glorify God. I said to her, dear woman, look around this room. Look at your sons. 
Look at their families. Consider the godly heritage. I said, you have glorified God. You will glorify God. And you're going to leave a legacy behind that will continue to glorify God. Bow down your ear to me. Lord, come close to me. It's, it's like a parent bending down uh, to listen uh, to the voice of his little child. I remember when our children were sick. You know, you'd go in there at night, you'd put their hand on, you'd put your hand on their back to see if they were breathing. And then you'd, you know, you'd stick your ear down there to hear if they were breathing. And, and sometimes their little voices would be like this and you'd bend down and so sweet, so tender. That's what David is talking about here. He says, bow down your ear to me. Come near, Lord, deliver me. This is a desperate cry. It's a cry of someone who feels like time is running out and I need deliverance and I need it now. He continues, he says, be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me, to deliver me. What he's saying here is be for me right now in my personal and present experience what I've always believed you to be by faith. What I've always believed is true of you, Lord, and what I believe is true of you when it concerns anybody else and everybody else but me, because I know how unworthy I am. Lord, please be for me right here, right now, in my personal present experience, what your word declares you to be. David here is a man in need of a refuge. And as we read on, he tells us that he finds that refuge in the Lord. We read in verse 3, For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Dropping down to verse 7, I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy. For you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversity. You have not shut me up into the hand of the enemy, but you have set my feet in a wide and spacious place. Uh, this is the opposite of a tight spot. So when David begins, he's saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm in a tight spot. But then he declares that the Lord has met him right at his point of need. And even though his circumstances may have not completely changed, yet he has the shalom of God, the peace of God. Even in the midst of the chaos, God has set things right in David's heart and in his thoughts. And he says, you've set my feet in a wide and spacious place. This is not unlike what we read just across the page in Psalm 32. Where in verse 6 of Psalm 32, David says, For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, their peril shall not come near him. He continues, verse 7, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. And so coming back to Psalm 31, seeking to make application of these things, I ask the simple question. We've talked about David and why he was in need of a refuge. So let's talk about ourselves and why it is that some of us, some of the time, might be in need of this kind of a refuge. Well, first of all, it's because of the difficult and distressing circumstances that life can bring and the pain and the sorrow that often accompanies them. This is what we read in verse 9, where David cries and he says, Have mercy on me, O Lord. For I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body also. Uh, the King James says, my, yea, my soul and my belly. It's, it's a vivid picture David paints here in his words. He says, my eyes are red from weeping. And, and, and the weight of sorrow is pressing down upon me. And the feeling of despair is closing in around me. This is agonizing. Maybe you've been there. Your gut's wrenching, tearing at every fiber of your being, and you're doubting in your prayers, 
and you're wondering if God cares, and you're questioning if he's really there. At times like those, we, like David, are going to look for a refuge, a place where we can find comfort, where we can find counsel, where we can take encouragement. So difficult circumstances, the first reason that we would need a refuge. The second is because of the sin in our lives and the guilt that often accompanies it. If you look at the latter part of verse 10, David describes uh, what sin uh, is doing and has done to him. He says, my strength fails because of my iniquity. The word iniquity there, uh, it's a word which would transliterate the twisting and the perverting of God's moral way. In other words, this is pushing the envelope. It's not necessarily that sign that says no trespassing, and then you willfully go and, and deliberately go on the other side of the line, but it, it's that idea of where you know you shouldn't, but you push against the edge. You push against the proverbial envelope. You bend the rules a bit, and what David did is that he, he didn't necessarily tell an absolute, complete lie to King Ahimelech, but he certainly didn't tell him the truth either. Because when David was there asking for bread for his men and later asking for a sword for himself, the priest said, David, why are you out of uniform? And how come you're not flying the company colors? And David essentially said, well, we're on a secret undercover mission for King Saul. That was a lie. And just then David looked and there was Doeg the Edomite, who is King Saul's chief herdsman. And David knew he was done at that moment. And what he should have done, what he could have done, but didn't do, is he could have said to him, like, you know what? Your life is in danger. The truth is, King Saul is out after me. He intends to kill me. And now, because I've come here and enlisted your help, your life is at stake as well. But he didn't do that. And as a result, a short time later, 85 priests at Nob were slaughtered. David says, my strength fails because of my iniquity. My bones are wasting away. The NIV says, my strength fails because of my guilt. And my bones grow weary. Read between the lines and you discover that these are some of the most difficult words for any person to choke out. Because of my iniquity. Because of my guilt. In other words, it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm the one to blame. These are difficult words for us to, to have to acknowledge. Spurgeon writes about this and he says, This is the bitterest pill of all, to know that our suffering need not have been, that the harvest of that this is the harvest of one's own sowing, that the vulture that feeds on the vitals is a nestling of one's own rearing. He says, ah me, this is pain. How true it, all, how true it is. The bitterest of all harvests are the ones of your own sowing. You know, this idea that, okay, man, you grew it, now you chew it. And it's even worse when you realize that the things that you're suffering didn't have to be. Things like being upside down financially because you're not a good steward of your resources. Or things like being fired from your job because you're, you weren't dependable. Things like knowing that you've damaged a close relationship because you failed to bridle your tongue and you fail to keep something shared with you in confidence, in confidence. And that list could go on and on and on endlessly. There's no doubt about it. These are the sorts of things that we suffer, and they can be excruciatingly painful. And this is the very thought described in the latter part of verse 10, where David says, my bones are consumed. That's, a, that's an interesting Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is ashish. It literally means to be racked with pain. Think about that. 
Like you, you know, you grew it, you chew it. The, you, the, you're reaping what you've sown and oh, oh, sheesh. What a word. Sheesh. I mean, you just racked with sheesh. It's like your bones are being gnawed away. That's what the Hebrew word describes. There are so many things that touch me, affect me deeply, cause me to grieve deeply. The world we live in, just in general, but the violent crime statistics in our country these days, every senseless murder I hear about. And you know what? It's just night after night after night after night. It, they grate on me. The school shootings. Like the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, where I think 21 people died and another 17 were wounded. Uh, Parkland High School, uh, what is it, uh, Marjorie Stroman Douglas, I think, um, there, you know, a student opening fire on students. Um, the more recent situation at the Covenant Christian School in, in Nashville. We hear about workplace shootings and, and the one that I don't know why it was, but it just affected me. This 25 year old young man with so much promise he learned that he was going to be let go of his job at a bank in Louisville. So he went and purchased an AK-47 and he walked in to the boardroom and he opened fire. He shot 13 people. The shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York from just about a year ago, racially motivated, an 18 year old white teenager clad in Barty armor with a tactical helmet to which his GoPro camera was attached so he could live stream his personal uh, bloody massacre of 13 people, all of who were African-American. Uh, we, we could just, I don't want to talk on and on about the violent crime around us. I, I'm just using that to sort of set the scene. It bothers me. It, it bothers me. It, the, the crime in our area, just think about Washington, D.C., for example. Now, with all that's been going on in Washington, D.C., and bleeding over the line into PG County, Maryland, uh, we'd think, well, certainly, you know, the crime there has to be in the, in the top uh, five of the nation, in, in the top ten of the nation. It doesn't even get, it doesn't even crack there. No, those cities are St. Louis, Detroit, Baltimore, Chicago, New York City, Memphis, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Stockton, California, Albuquerque, New Mexico. The, these, the sorts of things that are happening here that are our local news are happening there as well. And they become such a commonplace occurrence that it's like for some people, they just shrug their shoulders. And so that troubles me enough. But you know what really troubles me? What really troubles me is when I hear the story of those whose lives have ended as a result of a self-inflicted means. Here in the United States, according to statistics that I found just in the last day or so um, on the NIH website, suicide is now the second leading cause of death in people between the ages of 15 and 24. The number one reason given is depression. The number two is bullying. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, most teens interviewed after making a suicide attempt, and by the way, among teens, there are 18 attempts for every successful suicide, according to data. They say these that attempt suicide say that they did, it, they did it because they were trying to escape from a situation that to them seemed impossible to deal with or to get away from really bad thoughts. 
or feelings. And researchers have found that they didn't want to die as much as they wanted to escape from what was going on. But at that particular moment, dying seemed like the only way out for them. And these cases are so typical of the multitudes out there whose bones are consumed, whose lives are racked with pain. Those individuals who are so hassled and, and so hopeless and so haunted by the things they're facing that they're brought to the point of considering taking their own lives because they're unable to find a refuge. They're unable to find a place of shelter, though many of them have sought it desperately. That's a deep and troubling subject that it would take us hours to begin to understand all the different reasons why a person would even begin considering something so drastic. But those who have studied the many varied reasons behind suicide in an effort to avert suicide in the future have concluded after pouring over all the data that there are a couple of things in common that suicide people are looking for. The first is they're looking for an encouraging word. And the second is they're looking for an understanding shoulder to lean on. To say it another way, they're looking for a refuge, a place where they might hide or where they might heal or, or, or a place where they might find a willing, caring, available somebody. I wonder, would you be willing to make yourself available to be a refuge to a person like that? It isn't difficult to do. It's as simple as taking the opportunity to sit with them, to listen to them, and even to share with them the refuge that you have found, the refuge available to them through the person of Jesus Christ and the work he accomplished upon the cross. I think I'm so affected by suicide because it's such a part of my own testimony. I won't take long to go down that tributary, but I grew up in Southern California. I was in high school in the mid-1960s. I experienced the Jesus phenomenon up close and personally. And I identified myself as a Christian. One way, praise the Lord. But I was just a human chameleon. I was whoever I needed to be to succeed in the situation. And I lived like that for 11, the next 11 years. And then 44 years ago, last Friday, my brother was killed in a hang gliding accident, my just younger brother. We were extremely close and it rocked my world. And for the next nine weeks of my life were the most desperate, difficult, dark, unthinkable times of my life. When I struggled to find an answer. When I thought continually about self-harm because I was so empty, I couldn't feel anything and I thought if I could just feel some pain, then, well, maybe then I was actually alive. And at the, at the end of that nine-week difficult period, I walked into Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa yet again. And I heard the gospel message preached yet again that night. But on that night, I surrendered all. And I made Jesus the Lord of my life. August the 25th, 1979. And by the goodness and the grace of God, I was delivered and I have never looked back. I think that's why I'm so deeply affected by such things. And that's why I try to be a refuge. The Lord is the ultimate refuge, but I try to live a life that's available to people and can point them in that direction. There's a third reason um, why people need a refuge, and we need to really get busy on this. Um, and it's because, as David says, we're surrounded by adversaries and we're assaulted by misunderstandings. 
In verse 11, he says, I'm a reproach among my enemies, but especially among my neighbors and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those that see me outside flee from me. In other words, if I'm walking down the path and they see me, they walk, they cross over the other side. I'm forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. In other words, I'm like a piece of broken pottery. He says, I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side while they take counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. David has been betrayed here. And, it's, and, and betrayal is one of the most devastating blows of all. He says, I'm a re reproach to my enemies. Okay, I understand that. But I'm utterly contemptible to my neighbors and those who see me flee from me. I'm forgotten as a dead man. He said, I hear slander. I am fearful. They conspire against me. Maybe you've said some of those same things to yourself at one time or another. We often can become tortured by the whisperings of other people. In other words, the thought of what other people are saying about us is oftentimes more than we can bear. There's nothing quite like malicious gossip to push somebody over the edge. I mean, even the word itself hisses, gossip. It's like a serpent coiled and ready to strike. And poison is, is in its fangs, un, under the tongue. Maybe the Lord wants to speak to one of you or more than one of you tonight. And, and just to remind you that Discouraged people don't need critics. They don't need more piled on guilt. They don't need more distress. What they need is encouragement. Notice how David describes himself. He's like a broken vessel, like a piece of shattered pottery, no longer good for anything or to anyone, fit only for the garbage heap. makes us think of the woman at the well. If you know her story, you know that in the eyes of her neighbors, she was damaged good. She had no worth to any of them. She was fit only to be discarded and forgotten, marginalized, ostracized from her community. And yet, she had worth to Jesus. In fact, he asked her if she would draw him a drink of water. She was useful in the eyes of the Lord. She needed a refuge, and she found one one afternoon at Jacob's well in the person of Jesus. Are you in need of a refuge this evening but can't seem to find one? There's always one available. The one that David called my strength, mighty rock, fortress, stronghold, high tower. He says in verse 3, For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O God of truth. You have rescued me out of trouble, it literally should be translated. Psalm 34 and verse 7 it declares, the angel of the Lord is encamped round about those who reverence and regard him, those who fear him, and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. David's refuge never failed him, not even once. Now, granted, if you or I put our trust in other men, in other humans, they will eventually fail us or eventually forsake us. But if we put our trust in the living God, he will never leave us. He will never fail us. He will never forsake us. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I will not, I will not, I will not in any way forsake you nor relax my hold upon you Assuredly not. 
We sing it. We sing it all the time. Oh, no, you never let go. You never let go, no matter the circumstances, no matter the storm, you hold tight. Even when I can't hold on to you, your right hand has got hold of me. Psalm 62 in verse 5 declares, My soul waits quietly for God alone, for my expectation is from him, and my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I shall not be greatly shaken. I shall not be moved off my foundation. Again, David never regretted dropping the heavy load of his burden at the Lord's feet. Neither will you. I told you on August 25th, 1979, at the end of that nine-week period that began on June the 23rd of 1979, that I heard the gospel message again, a message that I'd heard, I was very familiar with, but this night, this night it was different. And, and it's not the message, the message was good. It's just I'd, I'd heard it and I'd been convicted and I'd hardened my heart against it, I guess you might say. Like God and I have an arrangement, we're gonna work this out. But on this night, I was thinking to myself as I looked at more than 2,000 people in this auditorium with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds others outside in the outside patio area. And I looked at these people and I, th all, I thought, all these people have their lives completely together, but mine is destroyed. So I was thinking to myself, you know, I just need to clean up my life. Then, then maybe I can come to God. Then maybe I'll be acceptable to him. So I'm thinking that. And this guy who's preaching, his name is Jimmy Kempner. He, he said, now some of you are thinking, and then he said that very thing, and it weirded me out. And I thought, this guy's reading my mail. How is that possible? But he said this. He said, you know, Jesus is the divine fisherman. He always cleans his catch. He's not asking you to clean up your life and come to him. He's asking you to come to him just as you are. And then he quoted what I learn now is Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. It's the words of Jesus. Come unto me, all you who labor and are burdened down with life and I will give you rest. And there it was. That simple word rest, I thought, yes, yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly of heart and you'll find rest and your souls, there it was. Tears welled up in my eyes for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I thought, Lord, my burden is crushing. And so, Lord, if you want my life, what's left of it? I'm like a piece of broken pottery. I'm, I'm no good to anyone for anything. But, Lord, if you want my life, I surrender it gladly. And in that moment, I prayed a simple prayer of surrender to the Lord. Yeah. I walked down an aisle like one of these and I stood in front of a platform like this. In fact, I did it rather dramatically. I got out from the back and I started coming down the row and, and I just, at that point, a dam broke and I was just, <laughs> and, I'm, and so then I'm jogging up here and there's already a group of people up front. So I just work my way through and I come right up the steps and I rock right over to the guy and he's looking at me thinking, I'm sure he's thinking, I hope there's an usher who sees this guy. And then I just look at him and I stick my hand out. And he took my hand. And somehow in that moment, when I looked into his eyes, I realized there was sincerity there. And I realized I was home. I didn't know exactly what that meant. But I left there that night knowing that I had been forgiven, knowing that old things had passed away, that all things had become new, and knowing this, that I always and at all times could find a refuge in Jesus. It was true then. It's true today. I got to land the plane. Let's pray. Lord, um, <laughs> Lord, I know now Austin will never have me come back to speak to the young adults. And Lord, certainly I didn't intend to share that, but 
it's just this time of the year, Lord, when these things are so fresh to me. And Lord, how I felt so many of the emotions that David felt. And how I had nothing to offer you but brokenness, shame, guilt. But you washed me. You forgave me. You put your spirit within me. You put a song in my heart and a spring in my step. You gave me a hunger for your word to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate upon it, to hide it in my heart that I wouldn't sin against you. And later, Lord, you put a call upon my life. And for that, I'm so very grateful. Lord, I pray for anyone here tonight who is in need of a refuge, that they would know beyond a doubt that they can find that refuge ultimately in you. Someone who will never fail, someone who will never forsake, someone who will never relax his hold on them. And Lord, for us tonight, that we would be willing to make ourselves a refuge to others in need, that we would provide a listening ear, that we would take things shared with us in confidence and hold them in confidence, that we would be a friend like Jesus that sticks close, especially at times of need like these. And so, Lord, bless these folks as they go. Bless their fellowship tonight. And may your name continue to be glorified in this place the rest of the evening. We ask together in Jesus' name, amen.